to love at work. Let us pray. Eternal Lord God, thank you that nothing can separate us from your love. Inspired by your self-sacrificing love, challenge us, O oh God, to use the power of your redemptive love to let your will be done on earth, even as it is done in heaven. We pray in the name of him who is love, and for his sake, amen. The focus of this musical is to challenge you and me to make love the root principle of obedience. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. With all your heart, you should love the Lord. That speaks of ethical congruence. Love God with your soul. We've heard about soulmates. My wife Brenda is here, and since this is being televised, I want the world to know she is my soulmate. Thank you, dear. But God wants to be our soulmate. And then he wants us to love him with all our might or strength. Love at work. Not eros, not phileo, but agape love. Understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for humankind. It is time to experience love at work.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Bible, 1,189 chapters, 31,102 verses, 40 inspired writers over a span of more than 1,500 years. And of its 1,000 plus pages, only one single page is personally handwritten by God, and thus the most important written document in human history, God's Ten Commandments. Ten declarations so important that God spoke and wrote them Himself. Ten rules that bring health and happiness to anyone who follows them. These Ten Commandments are more than ten suggestions or ten do's and don'ts. They are a comprehensive, concise description of the character of God. Let us begin our journey with prayer as we invite you now to get ready, ready to experience God's love at work. In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, I am the Lord and there is no other. I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Thou shalt have no other gods before me.
And God spake all these words, saying. To whom, then, will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to Him? The workman molds an image, the goldsmith overspreads it with gold, and the silversmith casts silver chains. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field are they. And they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. They are all the work of skilled men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not make unto in heaven. 
that is in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image I say to you, do not swear at all, but let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God when I shall be sanctified in you 
before their eyes. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name His name in vain, that taketh his name in vain. His name shall his name.
The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The History of Creation In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind. And it was so. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, 
God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. You know, in this world, the world itself has made great inroads into the faith of many people. It's getting harder, it seems, for many to hang on to God because the busyness of this world and the stresses of this world and the pressures of this world really conspire against us and seek to drive a wedge between us and God. And in a very skeptical world, a world filled with tragedy, a question that comes to mind often is, who is God and what is God really like? Imagine this then. When the sun sets on Friday evening, you can breathe a sigh of relief and say, the bills can wait, the yard can wait, the job can wait, hassles can wait, the world can wait. This is my special time with God. I've been taking time with God every day throughout the week, but now, like the icing on a cake, this is a whole day in the presence of God. Imagine that. It's holy time, it's sacred time, it's life-building, life-restoring time. And when the Sabbath comes, I remember, I remember, I belong to someone, and not just someone, but someone. I gather my family around me when the Sabbath comes and we remember that we belong to God. We are here for a reason, an eternal reason. Does it matter? Oh, it matters. Not merely from a, a legal thou shalt, that thou shalt not point of view, but experientially, emotionally, physically, spiritually. What a blessing. God gave the Sabbath day right back there in the Garden of Eden day seven of the first creation week. It was intended by God to be a blessing, something that binds the heart of human beings with the heart of God. God, the Bible says, gave this thing to us. Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man. You remember that? It was given as a gift. I want to encourage you, embrace that gift. Make that special gift a part of your life every single week. Let it be a highlight for you and for your family. And you will understand by experience that the Sabbath truly is the blessing that God designed it. You can look at the water and say, oh, it looks good, but you never know how good it is until you get in. You can think about the Sabbath and say, a day with God every week, a day with my family, a day for worship, a day without the world and its pressures. That sounds like a good idea, but I want to encourage you to take that next step. Let the Sabbath be more than a good idea for you. Let it be the blessing that God designed it to be. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy.
the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Keep it holy, holy. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Keep commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Honor thy father and thy mother. Bye. 
The sixth commandment zooms in deeper. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Then God says in the seventh commandment, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not
shall not circulate a false report. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. But 
Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Many years ago, when I was a young pastor in Florence, South Carolina, I worked all year in evangelism. And I was absolutely delighted because we were able to baptize 50 people. It was the largest number of baptisms in that particular area and church for uh, its history. I had to go to a workers' meeting. This was a meeting where you came together to report on what God had accomplished through you that year. And I stood up before my group of colleagues and reported that God had blessed me to baptize 50 people. The minister following me had a very sad story. He said he had attempted to do evangelism, but a storm had come and knocked down the tent where they were trying to have services. Moreover, he was very involved in trying to get a PhD from the University of Miami. He said because he had so many challenges, he was not able to do as well as he desired. So he was making a partial report of 200 baptisms. Suddenly, my 50 baptisms didn't seem very special at all. And I found myself coveting his accomplishment, coveting his church, and coveting his position. You shall not covet. Covetousness has to do with wanting something that belongs to someone else. I had to deal with covetousness in my heart and strive to conquer covetousness. How did I do it? I remembered, first of all, that my interior life is important to God. Covetousness is something that most people will never see. It is on the inside. It is a part of the thought life. I also began to understand that if I would love God passionately, my covetousness could be conquered. You too can conquer covetousness. Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good.
God's greatest gift to humankind. 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. The tent maker from Tarsus, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 put it this way, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am like a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I give my all to feed the poor, and yes, even martyrdom, give my body to be burned, and have not love, Agape, it does not profit me a thing. So fasten your seatbelts, love at work. people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking and when the people saw it they removed and stood afar off and they said unto Moses speak thou with us and we will hear but let not God speak with us lest we die and Moses said unto the people fear not 
For God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, They soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. They made a calf in Horeb and worshiped the molded image. Thus they changed their glory into the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their savior. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. Look unto me, unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Luke 4, 18.
You know, I became a believer in Jesus about 30 some years ago. And uh, before I believed in God, I, I, I went through kind of a struggle. It was a paradoxical struggle. On the one hand, you know, I'm Jewish and I'm raised in a Jewish home and Jews were raised on the Holocaust. And you read all these atrocities and there was a part of me, I wanted there to be a God. I wanted there to be, because I realized if there is no God, if there is no kind of ultimate judgment at the end of time, then there's no justice. All this horrible evil occurs in the world. We've all been seen it. Maybe you've been even a victim of it. There was always the side of me a little bit that thought, well, you know, if there is a God up there and the way I'm living my life uh, kind of made me a little nervous. So there was a part of me that I wanted a God and I wanted justice and I wanted judgment. And there was another part of me, for me personally, that didn't want that, that didn't want that. I guess I wanted it for others, but I didn't want it for myself. And I had a kind of feeling it wasn't going to work that way. Either it was going to be there for everyone or it was going to be there for no one. And I didn't like either option. Well then, anyway, what happens is I'm on a quest for truth. I'm a seeker for truth. I didn't care whether it was a God or no God. I was just a seeker. And about 30 some years ago, I ended up becoming a believer in Jesus and gave my heart to Jesus. And it was only after I gave my heart to Jesus and then I started to study the Bible and started reading and I started coming to some wonderful truths, things that gave me so much comfort and hope and somewhat helped, it will greatly help eliminate this paradox that I had struggled with, that there was a way to have these things, to have the justice and grace and mercy. We need to get ready. We're all on a journey. We didn't ask to be born and we're moving along the world and things are gonna end one way or another, but we're promised a good way out. We're promised eternal life and a new heaven and a new earth. And I suppose in a sense, Christ's righteousness, his blood, sort of like, it's like the stamp, it's the visa on our passport that guarantees us entry, eternal entry. And in many ways, it's so simple. You can't earn that visa. You can't do anything to get it. You surrender yourself to Jesus in faith. His righteousness covers you. The passport is stamped. And as a result, because we love God, we keep his commandments. So we live by faith and we manifest that faith through keeping his commandments. It seems to me to be just as simple and yet as profound as that. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people for I will forgive their
will put my law in their mind and write it on their heart and I will be their God and they shall be As a Christian, I stand before you not only a Christian in name, because that is my name, Christian, but I stand before you a lover of Jesus. But I never had that testimony as a child. I was born and raised in a home where there was no Christianity, there was no religion, in fact, the very opposite. And my mother was 16 years old when she got pregnant with me. My father was 18. What my mother didn't know was that my my father started using prescription medication, stealing it and using it when he was 14. And by the time he was 17, he was a full-on addict and he was also a daily drinker. He was an alcoholic at 17 years old. And so this would create unrest in my life. My mother had two more children with my father and so the three of us young boys were raised in a home where there was no Jesus. There was no hope. There was only a father that didn't come home at night who was out drinking and carousing. And when he did come home, it was only fighting and arguing. And so we went to bed every night listening to, the, through the, the wall of our bedroom, the fighting and the clamoring and more unrest, more unrest. And my mother finally got tired of it. And when we were, when I was seven years old, she decided to divorce him. And, and that brought some relief because now she could go to work. What she didn't know was when she put us in daycare that the daycare provider, her oldest teenager, was molesting about six of us little boys every day at nap time. And I began holding secrets deep down inside. And little did I know that keeping secrets would be really for the, a large part of my life as a teenager. My mother remarried. My biological father was in and out of our lives and when I was about 10 years old, he thought it was a good idea to get drunk, and he got into what we call a blackout. When you're so high on drugs and alcohol, you don't know what's going on. And he molested my brother and myself. And so it was yet another secret, more unrest. I couldn't trust my mother. I couldn't trust my father. I couldn't trust other people because I was afraid that they just wanted to hurt me. What I really needed was Jesus Christ, but I wouldn't find him until I was in my mid-twenties. And so my mother remarried and we thought, oh, he doesn't drink, he's not an alcoholic, he's got a job. That's great because by the time I was seven years old, we had moved 13 times from home to home because when you don't pay the rent, you get kicked out. And so we lived in abject poverty. But now this man had a job. The 
problem was, within about a year, he became our worst nightmare. And he began to abuse us physically, mentally, and emotionally. My mother would, would cover up her black and bru blue bruises with her clothing, and this abuse got out of hand. He threatened all of our lives and said if we told anyone, he would kill us. And we believed it because the abuse was already that bad. I've been beaten, I've been whipped, I've been tied up. I was hit so hard in the head as a young boy, I had a grand mal seizure and wound up in the hospital. But we just lied about it, made up a story, because we couldn't tell everybody really what was going on. Horrible unrest in my life. Up until my mother came to me after 10 long years of living with this man. My mother came to me one morning and said, Christian, we're leaving. What, what do you mean? We're leaving. I'm divorcing your stepdad. And friends, when you've been so oppressed, when you've been so beaten down and tore down mentally and emotionally, when you know something's going to change and you're going to be free, you can't wait for it. But she said, Shh, you can't tell anybody. Because she had planned and talked to the police department. She had talked to an attorney. And one Saturday morning, a morning that I would finally find rest on the Sabbath day. Our family came. The police came. And she told them, I'm leaving you. And we escaped. We got out of there. And we were free. And until you've been oppressed and burdened down, you don't even know how good freedom is. But the problem is, the bondage is what we were used to. That was our normal. My brothers didn't know what to do with it. And they got involved in drugs and alcohol. And their life was a wreck. And they even wound up in their later years going into prison, dealing drugs, manufacturing drugs. My mother finally became a Christian. She remarried for the third time. And praise God, she found a Christian man. And he was a good man. And he is a good man. He's still my dad today. And they've been married over 20 years, and my mother becomes a Christian, and I wanted nothing to do with Christianity. I thought it was for, it was for pathetic people that needed to believe in some big God up there that's going to make life better. And the reality was, what I needed was my Savior. I needed my God. I was so full of unrest. I went into college, got into professional theater, singing, dancing, and acting, and all the accolades and all the pats on the back and all the awards didn't fill this hole that I had. I couldn't satisfy the deep longings I had in my soul. I was a soul of unrest. All the negative programming of my life kept coming back anytime I would have a failure. And then I met a man who was a Christian and he began to just be my friend and I had some health problems. And he helped me through my health problems. And before you know it, I was studying the Word of God, and I, I started to open the Word of God kind of almost antagonistically. And I started looking at Matthew the, in the Gospels. I was told, just start in the Gospels. And I found my scripture, my friends. I found Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I needed rest. I needed rest in my emotions. I needed rest in my soul. What I didn't know my whole life was that I needed Jesus Christ because he was going to be my rest. And I fell on my knees and I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And he began to perform spiritual surgery on my soul. He started to heal me, my friends. And he's healed me completely. In fact, eight Years ago, my middle brother, my youngest brother, Brandon, found Jesus Christ, and he became a Christian. He now goes back into the prisons and serves the Lord. Two years ago, my, my middle brother finds Jesus. He gets clean and sober, and now he's part of a motorcycle club that goes to inner city kids and talks about drugs and Jesus Christ. My mother is now working as a woman with battered women and abused children. We all heard Jesus saying, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you need rest tonight, 
I want to encourage you to give your heart to Jesus Christ because he can heal your broken heart. And I want you to think of these, the words of this song. It's an invitation from Jesus to each one of you. It's entitled, Come Unto Me. And in Isaiah 57, 15, we are told that the high and lofty one 
who inhabits eternity dwells also with those who are of a contrite and humble spirit. Love at work. I heard this wonderful quote today that is still resonating in my heart. Simply says that we don't so much need peace in the world, we need peace in our hearts. And the peace that is in our hearts comes only through Jesus. Well, I resisted that for a very long time. I was even raised in a Christian home. And then when I was older, I went out and I began doing my own thing. I began to sing in a lot of secular venues. I sang out there in the world with names who many of you probably would recognize. And then one day somebody invited me to church. The people at church knew that I was a singer and so I agreed to sing the invitational song. But what I did not know is that the speaker was going to speak about the life that I was living. It was almost as if he was speaking directly to me. And then he calls me to sing the people song. And so I sat at the piano and began to play and sing. And I remember it was as if there was a great tug of war going on in my soul. God on one end and my own self-will on the other end. And it was as if God was saying to me, you know, Neville, you're singing about yourself. There's a line in the song that I sang that says, I have taken advantage of your love and grace. And I knew somehow that I was talking about myself, that I was the one taking advantage of his love and grace. And after I, I finished singing the song, the speaker gave an appeal. And so I accepted the appeal. And I was the only one that accepted the appeal. And so I like to say that our God, he tells each and every one of us, that he wants to give us peace, rest. All good gifts come from him. But most importantly, most importantly, we have a gift to give back to him. And the gift that we have to give back to him is our lives. Complete, 100% total surrender. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments.
Friend, that is the question, isn't it? This heart-to-heart -heart question to you from Jesus, my child, do you really love me? We've seen how on Mount Sinai, God wrote and spoke his law of love, love at work. Then on Mount Calvary, Jesus showed it, God's love at work. Bruised and beaten, bound and nailed to that old rugged cross. Jesus paid the price to give you life, hope, and peace. Friend, God loves you. 
whatever your past, He will forgive and give you a bright future. Yes, you can come home again. As you hear Him calling, my son, my daughter, do you love me? Will you respond, yes, yes, Lord, I love you. Friend, if you've just said yes to Jesus, I want to invite you to repeat this simple prayer with me. And I want to extend the invitation to that person who's already said yes to Jesus. John 14, 15 reads, If you love me, keep my commandments. And because you love Jesus, you realize that you really haven't been keeping all 10 of his commandments, nine maybe, or just a few. Here's good news. When Jesus says, keep my commandments, it's not just a command, it's a promise. That's why Jesus in the very next verse, John 14, 16, promised to send you the Holy Spirit so you can do just that, to become the person you've always wanted to be. Obedient, kind, pure in heart, a new creation, a new you. It's all wrapped up in this promise as you cooperate with God. So I invite you right now to say yes to Jesus. If that is your desire, then simply repeat this little prayer with me and offer it from your heart. I'll say a phrase, just repeat each phrase after me out loud. Father in heaven, I hear your call and say, yes, Lord, I love you. I give you my heart. Forgive me for breaking your law of love. Right now, I accept your gift of eternal life through Jesus' sacrifice on Calvary for my sins. And I give you full permission for your Holy Spirit to write your Ten Commandments law on my heart and mind. Keep me on the path to heaven as I walk by faith trusting you. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Friend, God has heard your sincere prayer. You are the apple of his eye. And I want to encourage you to keep growing in him. One of the ways to do so is to participate in our follow-up Bible study series in song, Love Me. Stay tuned for information on how to enjoy this timeless, breathtaking series with the Love at Work singers and Love Me contributors, hosted by yours truly, Lonnie Velashenko, and my nine-year-old co-host, Logan. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the grand finale of the Love at Work musical with Chaplain Barry Black and the Love at Work singers. The Bible says, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself.
Let us just bow our heads for the benediction. Eternal Lord God, we thank you for the palpable presence of your Holy Spirit in this auspicious cathedral tonight. We give ourselves passionately to you, heart, soul, mind, and might. So bless us and keep us. Make your face shine upon us and be gracious to us. Lift the light of your loving countenance upon us and give us your shalom. It is in Jesus' glorious name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.